Hello and welcome to Comic Book Herald's Deep Dives. This is our second iteration of this new feature we're starting where we take a look. This is Dave Busing, founder and editor-in-chief of comicbookherald.com, alongside John Galati. Take a look into the um, you know one series, one comic book series at a time that we're extremely excited about. And in this case, something else that's on our 2019 best of list. It's the Immortal Hulk. And as I mentioned, I'm joined today by... John, he is writer supreme over at Comic Book Herald, editor supreme for all the videos that are going up on the Comic Book Herald YouTube channel, or is he both? In the spirit <laughs> of the Immortal Hulk, we can always be more than one thing. How's it going, John? It's going all right. I'm one by day and one by night. One by day. Yeah, there you go. Perfect. So we're going to get really deep into the Immortal Hulk today. We're going to look at this series. I think the big question that I want to frame, we've got a number of questions, but the big one that I want to frame for our conversation today is... Why has the Immortal Hulk been such a hit? Both critically, this is a almost universally beloved book. You see it on all sorts of best ofs in 2018 and continuing into 2019. And also, like, why is it so popular? The book is selling very, very well, which is kind of uncommon for Hulk comics. It's been kind of relaunched and restarted a bunch over the last decade. Um, but it's also pretty uncommon for a book going into its 20th issues. You know, it's why we see Marvel rebooting with new number ones all the time is obviously that is uh, kind of a challenge. Once you get to like issue 16, 17, is the book still selling? And in the case of The Immortal Hulk, there have been some features recently. There's a really good one written by um, a journalist, Chase Magnet, over on comicbook.com. Immortal Hulk sales have actually increased as the book has continued, which is mm. like almost unheard of, you know? So I want to talk about why. Like what what is it about this book that it's succeeding in that manner? And we're going to talk about a whole host of other things. So we're going to talk about, I think, the first 22 issues of the book that have been released today. If you are unfamiliar with these or don't want anything spoiled, um, I would recommend go read these. We can do it along with the CBH uh, Reading Club over on patreon.com slash herald where I'll be announcing what's going to be our deep dive of the month, and then you can read along. Uh, but again, if you want to like pause here, go read 22 Issues of Hulk. Highly recommended. Come on back and listen to our conversation. Or if you just want to know what's going on, hey, stay and hang with us, and we're going <laughs> to be talking about it. The, the one thing that really stood out to me about Immortal Hulk is it's a vision by creators Al Ewing and Joe Bennett primarily on art. And it's this vision and it's kind of a style where the comic, the character of the Hulk, breaks away from the formula that yeah. we've known in the past. You know, like there's there's kind of a, a Hulk that everyone knows, the big green rage monster and the mat, you know, the angrier he gets, the madder he gets, the stronger he gets everyone is somewhat familiar, right? And then, mm -hmm. of course, there's like the big MCU version where he's even kind of an Avenger. How do, how does not only Immortal Hulk, but like Marvel Comics break away from their formulas in order to create something that can be so amazing, so deep into a character's history? And I would say examples of series like this would be like The Fraction Age of Hawkeye, King Walt of Vision, and even like Hickman on Powers of X or Powers of Ten, House of X right now. What do you think Immortal Hulk's doing that follows the same vein where it's like it's something so special it breaks away from the formula i think for immortal hulk in particular what they're really doing is they are touching the third rail of removing banner as much as possible in other iterations of the hulk uh usually banner plays this big controlling influence or he is uh absorbed into it in the way that like peter david did with professor hulk so there's a lot of there's a lot of banner there's either an adversarial or an almost um, cumulative effect between the two characters. And Immortal Hulk really kind of does away with them in a way that's fascinating to me. Mm -hmm. uh, because in, on the one hand, they've made him kind of not as smart as he used to be. And we don't know if that scar tissue from getting shot in the brainstem by uh, Hawkeye way back when, or if that's something else that's going on. Maybe Hulk is bringing him down and making him dumber now. Um, so that's a, a great aspect to it. But there's also the fact that Bruce Banner has to restart his day every single time. Mm -hmm. Like with Hulk coming on at night, usually it felt like Bruce temporarily became Hulk. But now it feels like Hulk is temporarily becoming Bruce. He's waking up naked. He has no clothing. He needs food. Like how do you build a life for yourself if you know that every night the Hulk is going to wake up and destroy something? Um, which is also getting to the whole idea of every night. 
back in the day, like in the 70s and the 80s, even in David's run, uh, until they merged both personalities, Hulk only came out every so often. Now he's out every single evening. And with Joe Fixit taking over at one point during the day, it was 100% Hulk. Different iterations, but still 100% monster. And I think that change is really what's catalyzed this by getting Banner out of the way. That we got into here thinking that Banner had killed the Hulk, and now it almost seems like the Hulk has killed Banner. Yeah, I think that's a good way to put it. And it's so let's, there's a piece of this that I wanted to touch on a little bit later in terms of like use of continuity, but I'm going to talk about it a little bit here because Ewing is taking what happened in Civil War II, which is a Marvel Comics event in 2016, written by Brian Michael Bendis. And in that issue, somewhat famously, I guess, spoilers for Civil War II. <laughs> if, you, if you haven't read it, I don't recommend you do so. Um, but, like, Bruce asks Hawkeye, he's like, if you ever, if it ever looks like I'm going to Hulk out, I want you to shoot me with this gamma radiated arrow I made just for this occasion and kill me. And Clint's like, I don't want to do that. Bruce insists. And then Clint does so in this moment. It's kind of like the crux of Civil War II is this big thing where it looks like the Hulk's going to rage out and kill a bunch of people. Hawkeye takes him out. And Ewing plays with that in order to set the stage for a Bruce Banner that we know has died, has been brought back to life by the Hulk, effectively. And, like, that premise is basically the Hulk always comes back. Banner can die, but the Hulk cannot. Like you said, the night is his time. So anytime it's night, going back to the Lee Kirby days of kind of like how the the semantics of when does Hulk come out, the Jekyll and Hyde relationship, it's, you know, okay, it's dark, the monster comes out. That's that's Hulk's relationship now. And also you have Banner very specifically being like something in that, maybe it was something in the arrow, made me, like I'm still intelligent, but I'm not like a genius anymore necessarily. I'm like, you know, the Tony Stark, like top, you know, Amadeus Cho, Reed Richards, genius level of the world. And he admits several times throughout the story, the Hulk's smarter than me now. And it's not the first time we've seen a smart Hulk, but it's the first time I remember seeing Banner admit that. Well, it's the first time we've seen a smart Hulk that didn't have Banner, I think. Right, right. Like Banner's in control, therefore he's still smart kind of thing. Mm -hmm. No, it's like a totally different Hulk personality who's just super intelligent um, in the ways that he is. And and they kind of go on to define that. But yeah, I think like you're saying, it kind of is removing Bruce Banner as a player. Like he doesn't, he just kind of, Go he, like he's literally following the like he's the gamma that the Hulk is sensing. He's just kind of following it around and finding trouble and being like, where can I put the Hulk so he's of most use? There's only like one sequence after the um the really like insane uh, eruption of Sasquatch in the hospital where it's kind of revealed that like okay the Hulk is back the world knows this Sasquatch just killed a bunch of people but it looks you know people are kind of blaming the Hulk. And there's only like a couple, maybe like a few pages where Banner's like, he's been up for a couple days and he's trying to keep the Hulk at bay. But even then, he's only doing it because he thinks something else kind of supernatural came in to infect the Hulk. So yeah, I think you're spot on in saying this one's breaking away from Hulk formula because the story isn't Banner by day, Hulk by night. It's kind of like Hulk all the time and Banner's just around. And I think what we've seen over the course of 22 issues is... You talked about it being 100% monster with Joe Fixit personality mm-hmm. taking over Bruce Banner. I think now Bruce Banner just as himself is like 100% monster. Like he's he seems game too, even when maybe he's in his faculties. Yeah. So it's it's all sort of moving towards this devil Hulk persona um, and, and whatever the agenda is there. And I think that is compelling. I think that's like people read Hulk comics, I think generally for good Hulk not mm-hmm. necessarily for Bruce Banner. So I think it's all kind of working. Um, I also wrote down some elements of like what what makes a series, a long running series work. So I'm curious what your take is on this. Um, when it like, basically like what makes it special? What makes it break away? The first one I wrote down was a commitment to vision and themes. Just like this book is, it has a purpose, it has a vision, and it's going to commit to that. In the case of the Immortal Hulk, there's also then like the the piece that comes along with that if creative consistency like the same people and their vision are working on this book and for the most part it's Al Ewing and Joe Bennett you know mm-hmm. like they're even when they have other artists join in they're committed to what they're calling quote unquote the horror hulk all the time so i think that is a huge part of it i think adding something new 
is an element that like is absolutely essential to transcending what the comic or what the character has been before. In this case, I think like, yes, there's the horror thing that everybody talks about, but actually the bigger thing for me that they're adding is like dark magic. Mm-hmm. I've never thought sure. of Hulk as sort of supernatural and they're doing a lot here where he is. How is that? How's that working for you in terms of like the dark hellish sort of supernatural aspects? Yeah, that's, that's a really interesting take on it because on the one hand, to me, Hulk has always had some element of the supernatural to him mm-hmm. um, all the way back from when he fought uh, the Wendigo and Wolverine joined in. Like yeah. there have frequently been these kind of reasons to have one monster fight another. I don't know that it's ever, it's always felt like uh, like Hulk was science's monster up against some other, you know, non-science folklore, folk magic kind of idea, you know, ignorance versus right. intelligence idea. And I think now that he's getting sucked into this, and especially if there's this weird heaven and hell aspect, or at least hell aspect to it, that's mm-hmm. going on, seeing him in a kind of uh, Judeo-Christian form is really fascinating too to me. And I don't know how they're going to blend that. And they've been going kind of deep, because when Hulk uh, goes into the hell dimension with the um, with the uh, with Jackie, he mm-hmm. goes across this area that's this destroyed city, and one of the buildings belongs to Jason Hellstrom. Oh, really? I didn't know Yeah, that. that the actual son of Satan like is in there. So it's an interesting kind of plug into that area. Uh, I really, that's the part I'm the most excited about right now with Hulk, is seeing this whole new avenue open up to him. Yeah, and, and I think that's, that's what the next element actually I kind of had was like, one easy way to get critical acclaim with a superhero comic, slow down the superheroics. Mm -hmm. like it works nine times out of ten especially if all the you know the vision and the creative consistency is there and in hulk it's not it's not doing it as hard as like fraction age hawkeye or like vision by king and uh, walter hernandez but it's doing it you know and it's it's saying like it's not hulk versus the avengers all the time although there's a very cool Mm two-issue sequence where it is but it's also like just yeah the hulk in hell and it's a version of hell that I don't know that it even maps to the many versions of Marvel hell that we know. Yeah. Like, is this Mephisto's hell? Is this Thor's 1L hell? I No, I don't think it is. Like, this is the green hell. Yeah, I thought this was almost like uh, an Americana hell because it's taking place around, you know, all these nuclear test sites that mm-hmm. it feels it feels like the irradiated wasteland hell that I don't know mm-hmm. that we've seen yet. And I I think the interesting thing about this hell and and really about, like, the big bad of the Immortal Hulk is we're going to talk about, like, some of the characters who are kind of the antagonists. But, like, really the the devil is Bruce Banner's father. um, Yeah. Who is the Hulk's father, I think, is, like, a correlation that maybe we don't always make throughout Marvel history. You know, you think of Bruce Banner's dad as, like, he's got a history of being abusive and and Mm -hmm. cruel and somewhat, you know, he's, he's sinister, definitely. But you don't always think of him as the Hulk's dad, you know? But, like, mm-hmm. it, it, it's sort of Ewing's laying the ground here where this father figure, it's like he kind of knew the Hulk was born with yeah. Bruce. It's like they were always connected, even before the Gamma Bomb, which is an interesting idea. Um, and it really, it really gets under your skin with, like, the this dad is, like, evil incarnate. You know what I mean? Like, oh, he's, yeah. he is the devil, but it's still, I think even through 22 issues, I don't really know what he is. I think big picture, we again, like getting back to the, the main core, is this, like, I think we both agree this is a really good Hulk comic. I think oh, we yeah. both agree this is a really good superhero comic. I would say it's, for me, it's probably, like, in the realm of, like, my second favorite Marvel book in 2019. I think mm-hmm. it was my favorite of 2018. So it's very high up there for me. I quite like it. Again, getting back to the question of why is it so successful for the Hulk, the villain. Villain always plays a role in this book. We talked about Hulk's one below all, Devil Dad, being kind of part of it, which I think has mm-hmm. been very successful. You asked the question, General Fortain, or General mm-hmm. Fortain, he's kind of the he's the leader of Shadow Base the organization that is trying to capture Hulk. So there's a long history of the military trying to obtain and stop the Hulk. This is a shadow base. It's literally that. It is, you know, mm-hmm. under like under the radar. Nobody seems to know about it except those who do. Um 
General Forkeen, I had to look up. I assumed he was a protege of General uh, Thunderbolt Ross's from, like, way back when. You know, that probably he had a long Marvel history. He's actually pretty recent. Um, he he kind of comes in during, like, the Red Hulk days, which I was very surprised by. Yeah, I was the same way. I'm like, Because I, I got him uh, confused with... Uh, there's a character from Peter David's run that's at the yeah. very beginning yeah. who was the head of the Hulk Busters. I got him confused for that dude since they I are was thinking very the same. similar. Because they go to like, is that like the Rock and Redeemer stuff? It's been a while since yeah, I Yeah, that's the run. Redeemer armor. They go to the moon. It's that one. Yeah. Yep. No, I, I had the same thing. Um, And then I looked it up and I'm like, oh, this is a totally different character and he's kind of new. So your question is basically like, is he a good villain antagonist? Is he? Does he measure up? to the storyline, I would have said for like 15 issues or so, no. I didn't yeah. even realize he was the villain. You know what I mean? Like, I thought there's the doctor that sort of experiments on all the, when they get the Hulk's body parts mm-hmm. in a bunch of different jars, like, to, he was the villain for me, for initially, aside from the the whatever devil sinister thing is coming into the Hulk. It's clearly like the real problem. But then that individual is absorbed by the Hulk, <laughs> and look quite literally absorbed in like issue 10 so i'm like okay it's not him but then over the last like i don't know five seven issues it's become clear like we've gotten a lot more detail about this new general the leader of shadow base and his history as a protege of ross's and kind of why he set out to take down the hulk and it's a lot of the same reasons mm-hmm. i think that the the leaders of the military have always been set out like the Hulk is vicious and destroys and kills and is never held accountable. Right. And I think they're all they're all like kind of understandable reasons. I think that you know, as like fans of superhero comics, we see as the problems with the Hulk. I think what's made fourteen really interesting lately is his willingness to experiment and accept necessary evils, including what is now become like the Abomination armor which is this grotesque use of, like, the abomination skin and suit that can, like, graft onto a person. And after they had experimented and grafted this onto Rick Jones in one of the, like, grossest, like, manipulate... Like, oh, yeah. Rick Jones has not had a good Immortal Hulk, let's just say. <laughs> like, <laughs> it's been a rough three to four years for Rick Jones. Um, yeah. <laughs> for sure. I, I'm wishing him well in the future. But after that whole sequence going awry, 48 puts on the Abomination armor himself. So I think now he's become really compelling to me. Like now he is, quote unquote, the Abomination, but he's not Emil Blonsky like we knew. He's not just like, yeah, you no. know, like Hulk, uh, Hulk, Dark Hulk or whatever, which is basically what the Abomination's been in the past. That was a lot. What do you think? Is Is he a good villain? Like, is he... I think he's going to get more interesting, I guess, is the thing. And I prefer him to Ross's Fire and Brimstone, which they talk about a lot being too mm-hmm. close to the subject. And I think that's true. He was like the angry father-in-law yeah. always. And I like him. I agree with that. I mean, at first I was I was a little turned off. Fordian was going down this road because he was so upset by what happened to his mentor. And he was he grew to understand Thunderbolt's anger. But yeah. then, you know, when he found out that Thunderbolt turned himself into the Red Hulk... He uh, Fordian lost his mind about it and was tremendously upset, and that's kind of the catalyst for a lot of what we're seeing in Immortal Hulk. I like that that bothered him, actually. What seeing his mentor go that way? Ross turn into Red Hulk. Yeah, I like that he was like that is a step too far because it's a, it's an understandable character trait, I think, to be like you became the monster, but then it also cast in the light of him now becoming the Abomination is clearly like, but you just did it. <laughs> you just yeah. did exactly what you said you didn't like. So I think he's got some complexity there. I don't know. It, it felt like when uh, the British Navy used to complain about people going native to his original concern about Hulk, that it, that it somehow tainted uh, Thunderbolt to go that way. Mm. And now that he's wearing the armor, I could see him trying to justify it by, this is a suit that I'm wearing, this isn't me, even yeah. though we see him bleeding something out of his nose and clearly going kind of crazy. Yeah, it's like, dude, you got um, abomination coming out of your nose. <laughs> but yeah, right. <laughs> You're not that far removed. I, I find Fordian's initial motivation in this kind of lacking. Like, he did not yeah. have enough skin in this game. And that's kind of where I'm going to be fascinated where Ewing takes it. Because I think in the next two issues, they're going to end the, the Fordian arc. Mm-hmm. But I'm sure he'll come back in some kind of regard before this is all over. Yeah. Uh, but for right now, he doesn't feel truly personally invested to me 
like Thunderbolt as, as even though he was way too close to the issue, like he was out of his mind about it. His motivations were clear as well. Yeah. Right. They were powerful and they were clear. And with Master, you get the same thing. Uh, even with Abomination, you kind of got this idea of what was driving him and what was sending him forward. Mm -hmm. Fordian feels a little light on that to me, but that might just be because this is stage one of whatever Ewing has planned for him. Yeah. The fact the fact that he's so light makes me wonder if there's a if there's a shoe to drop. And mm -hmm. specifically it makes me expect he is in some way controlled by the leader. <laughs> like, I'm just constantly waiting for the leader to show up. Anytime I read a Hulk story. I definitely think that there's something pushing him. Yeah. Just because it's such a big leap. I think it was only a couple issues where he's where we see the story of him talking to Thunderbolt and being so disappointed. And then jumping into him wearing the suit. Yeah, like, it's right. such a big move that, yeah, you're right. I bet there's something else. Yeah, I, I'm, I kind of hope there is, I guess, because, yeah, I think he does need rounding out a little bit more. Um, I do think the like the whole the whole the institution versus the Hulk thing is pretty tired for me. Yeah. Like it's a thing we've seen a lot. Um, you know, I think military versus Hulk tends to be pretty boring. I yeah. think that's another way that you know, we talked about this breaking from the formula. That's one thing Ewing Bennett and everyone else involved have done really well because Shadow Base is it's fuzzy dark ops and it is a little bit different you know the stuff they're doing like they have these monitors that are like these people hanging from tech with like tech into their brains and it's this weird like minority report sort of cold war kind of thing yeah cold, but they're also like they're funny like they kind of have that like oh bro are you watching this like <laughs> this weird way of speaking you know right so there's all these weird quirks again we had like the dark mad scientist again literally had the hulk split up into bottles and some of the most striking images yeah. in the entire sequence and then two they're experimenting on like the absorbing man you know like they bring him in and they experiment on him throwing gamma into him mm -hmm. and then obviously they're doing all this stuff with the abomination armor so i find them more compelling than i found you know Stop, Hulkbuster operations in in Marvel's past. So much of the military in the past was used the same way that sort of Ang Lee's movie used it, and that it's an excuse to blow things up. Yeah, and there's very little of that with Shadow Base. You're right. There's no tanks. Uh, it's there's not no. It's yeah. not interesting. Like I like don't we've need seen to that. see more bombs dropped on the Hulk and know he's fine. Yeah, it just it's, doesn't do anything. And yet, it was really interesting to watch Bushwhacker do ops in like populated areas. That was so much more compelling. Yeah, right, right. It, like to see, yeah, one individual, which I didn't realize it was like Bushwhacker <laughs> first love for like two issues, and then I was like, wait a minute, oh, this is like another guy that I know. Interesting. Um, but yeah, like having one op be like, I'm gonna shoot uh this special cyanide hollow tip into the Hulk's eye at an opportune moment just mm -hmm. to set him off against a uh, gamma flight which is an element we've barely even mentioned, which is like Alpha Flight turned Gamma Flight turned kind of like not Hulk Busters, but sort of like eh, sort of. trying to contain slash understand him. I, I don't know how much we need to get into that. Um, okay. All that said, the one I think probably the maybe last thing before we wrap up that I want to talk about is Ewing. It, he's very good at using Marvel continuity to tell stories. Uh, I think he has a better understanding of, of how to use like Marvel's entire history and in sort of seamless ways than really any creator working at the publisher currently. I think we saw this, I don't know if you read it, but in Marvel Comics 1000, he's the writer doing the framing sequences of like in the 1940s, this happened and that re is relevant to this thing that happened in 1969 and that mm -hmm. is relevant to this thing that's happening in 2019. It, like that's, that's kind of his mentality. And the Hulk, it obviously doesn't have to go that deep, but he's using a lot of like recent continuity, things like Civil War II, Secret Empire, as well as, of course, the Lee Kirby days of, of the Hulk. The question I have here is continuity is typically seen as like a barrier to new reader-friendly books. I think Immortal Hulk is very quickly falling into the vein of a book that like Vision, like Hawkeye, you could turn to a, a somewhat new comics reader and say, hey, check this out. Like, check out Immortal Hulk. It's a good way to get into comics. I think that's a really good, mm -hmm. like, there's a good strong argument for that to be made, except it's way more continuity heavy. How do you think they're pulling that off? And what, I think that, like, what, is the instruction or like what is instructive of this that could be used for other comics that struggle with the continuity and with baggage of characters history sometimes deep pulls feel like they're just showing off to be honest yeah, yeah. Uh, there's not a whole lot of that here 
I would argue that when Ewing is showing off is stuff like the um, the remote viewing people from Shadowbase. They feel very much like something out of uh, David's run. That they feel that same punny, humorous, out there, but also kind of spectacle and illustration. That that's a great tonal reference without you really needing to know where it's coming from, you know. You can enjoy it for what it is, and yeah. you might enjoy it even more if you're like, oh, I pick up on that as a, a, yeah. s- a subtle homage or something like that. Yeah, I, I think that's fair. Like the fact that Jackie is from the 70s TV show is not, you know, it's not super necessary, but it works. Like, right, like I read the entire story before we talked without that, that knowledge. I don't feel like I missed anything. That's cool. I, I like that, you know, make all the references you want. But it, yeah, I don't think it changes the story. Um, I do think one thing he does amazingly well is the balancing act of leveraging continuity to tell the story he wants to tell anyway mm-hmm. without being burdened by that continuity. So I referenced, you know, the Civil War II thing. Um, but basically, instead of being burdened by a not very good event, <laughs> yeah. he leverages it to set up a scenario where Bruce Banner can wholeheartedly admit, I think the Hulk's smarter than me now. And it's a really cool character detail. It's a really cool kind of inversion of the way we typically understand them that is based in something that happened in in a Marvel Comics event not that long ago. You know, mm-hmm. so it becomes relevant and it sets the stage for it's it it makes it feel like the event was always building to a mortal hulk yeah as opposed to the other way around which is how continuity can often feel like oh we're trying to work this in because it happened and editorial told us we have to no it makes it feel like they always had this plan which is really cool that's and really while, clever while he's thinking about it he's like he's investigating the um the gamma problem that he's there to be doing anyway so it's like yeah. nothing stops. Nothing stops to throw that continuity in. It mm-hmm. just keeps telling the story, but it sort of brings up like, oh, here's this thing that happened. Yeah. And here's why it matters for the story moving forward. I think that's super cool. The moment with Hawkeye, and that's like the only character he really needed was that little payoff. That's great. Yeah. Of course, actually, yeah. did that happen in Avengers or did that happen in Mortal Hulk? Were they, which, those two which meet moment? The when he moment meets Hawkeye where, again? Yeah, where he meets Hawkeye again. I think that was Avengers. I think it's Avengers because I haven't yeah. seen seen it yet in okay. um in immortal hulk yeah because when he meets the avengers and they fight there's a moment mm. there that i really like which is uh he he's like there's this moment of of basically they're saying the hulk can like smell lies is in this kind of persona and he can like cut to the core basically yeah of any of anyone it's like he knows their deepest darkest secrets type thing and he says to cap when he's fighting him He's like, I forget what he says, like, oh, it's Hydra Cap. Like, if I break off one of your heads, will one more take it place? And just immediately Cap's like, oh, that wasn't me. <laughs> like, he's so sad. Yeah, we've never you know? seen Hulk be that psychological before, but that's really clever. Yeah, he gets in Jen Walter's head big time by basically saying, like, there's no difference between you and me. Um, and then the, the one I love the most is he's beating Iron Man to a pulp. T'Challa's like, you're going to kill Tony if you keep at this. Because they're still like, like, Hulk was on the Avengers what three years ago you know it hasn't been that long um so there's always that sort of frenemy ship with them but uh but hulk or t'challa says you're gonna kill him he was your friend and hulk just scoffs at this he's just like what are you talking about and i love that i love yeah. that. i think i talked about this the last time we talked hulk should always have a grudge against everyone who shot him into space <laughs> <laughs> don't let it go i'm fine no. with that <laughs> like you can always be mad about that and you know planet hulk and world war hulk happened it's just a panel he's just like laughing at that idea and then he carries on into to beating up the avengers so i think the instructive thing for me with ewing using continuity like this is l- leverage it to tell the story you were going to tell anyway mm. don't try to respond to continuity like none of it is like course corrective you know or like trying to answer something it's just using it and yeah. i think that i think that's like it's cool if you know it it's great if you don't you're not actually missing much like you yeah. don't have to go back and read civil war 2 to enjoy the, the moment we talked about it it genuinely would not help yeah so no i agree right. with that Cool, cool, cool. So I think that answers most of the questions that we had that we wanted to tackle. I did have one other, not even a question, just a fact. For those of you reading along at home, check out the cover to Immortal Hulk number 13. There is, in fact, comicbookherald.com referenced on 
the cover. I was super excited to find this. I was literally in on the maternity ward celebrating the birth of my second son <laughs> and, <laughs> and reading Immortal Hulk. And I found that the CBH was referenced on there. And I got to say, I don't want to pretend I was more excited about my, my name on the cover, but, but it was a contest for a moment. Um, so what I wanted to, why I wanted to bring that up is one, just to brag because I'm super excited about it. Um, mm. But two, it was my favorite comic, my favorite Marvel comic, 2018. Where does it stand for you this year so far? Because again, like in terms of long running Marvel series, again, is it 22 issues? Venom, maybe Runaways, books mm-hmm. that have been running that long, like it's it's definitely around the top of them. Where do you have it this year? So far, I'd say it's probably in the top five. Mm-hmm. No, it's yeah. it's pretty up there. I do think, purely from a Marvel standpoint, I'm definitely more excited for House of X Powers of Ten to come out now than I am at any point for Mortal Hulk, which is not a dig at a Mortal Hulk yeah. so much as just that book is like an event, unlike unlike most things I've ever experienced. Maybe that'll be a deep dive we do once it concludes. Um, mm-hmm. But otherwise, like Marvel books that every week I'm just like issue to issue keeping up with because they're essential. It's kind of the Venom, Absolute Carnage, Kate's run, which have you been reading Absolute Carnage? I've been reading it a bit. Yeah, it's I so think I'm fun. a little bit behind. It's so fun. It's doing a lot of the same things as Hulk, actually, that I think yeah. in, in successful Yeah, they've got a devil it. in there. They've got some, you know, some interesting pulls from uh, continuity. Yeah, it's, it's there's a similar formula. That's a Yeah, that's a good point. Long story short, Mortal Hulk's real good. I've got it yeah. probably number two, maybe three in my favorites of Marvel for the year. But of course, we've got some time to go. All right. I think the last question that I've got before we head out is, so traditionally, Hulk is the story about anger or sadness or loneliness. Is this the story, all of a Myrtle Hulk, is this the story about greed? Because almost every character's intersection right now with Banner is about greed they, they hit it hard enough for me that i can't shake thematically it's still the question is or is he both but yeah. applied to everyone and it's kind of ironically it's kind of like the trite like uh prestige tv guy looking in the mirror like am i a good man <laughs> like it's kind <laughs> of that over and over you know um but i actually really like it in the context of the hulk because it's basically welcoming like is he the hero is he the monster or is he both well of course he's both yeah. Of course, like he should be both. Um, I guess the the one unexpected answer would be like, is he both? Nope, he's just the monster. <laughs> like, or he's unexpected. neither. He's just the Hulk. It's almost at the point right now with the story that the Hulk feels like a like a true force of nature. Mm-hmm. Like it feels like something that's pre. It certainly predated our our previous history with Banner and our previous conceptions of when Hulk may have come into play. Right. But if there is a hell. And if there is a hell for these hulks, doesn't that imply that there have been hulks for a long period of time? Hmm. That it's just been something that was waiting to be opened up by the green door? That's that's really interesting. So, the yeah, the way they play with the green door is like Hulk and all that gamble was just waiting to come mm-hmm. into our world. Like it's just magic, was basically. Born, basically. But yeah, but and but then you also have things like Jason Aaron's prehistoric Avengers, where and I'm not 100% on this, but I feel like Starbrand is like basically a Hulk of the BC Avengers. Yeah, I'll need to check that out again because what you're saying is really interesting because this could open it up to that sort of legacy, immortal Iron Fist ty- style narrative where yeah. it's like, who was the Hulk before the Hulk? Right. That type of story would be... Marvel's done a lot of that in recent years. Um, I, w- I could see it going that direction. That'd be cool. I think that's going to do it for us before I get myself in more trouble. Um yeah, this has been our deep dive on the Immortal Hulk. If you're enjoying these, thanks for listening. And you can find all the content over on compocarol.com. You can find more of my writing and John's writing there as well. You can find these conversations. Uh, the podcast is Best Comics Ever. The YouTube channel is at Comic Book Herald, where you can also find me uh, really anywhere on social. So again, if you're enjoying the deep dives too, I'll be trying to share these out through patreon.com slash Herald for readers so you can read along and then listen to and watch our conversations here. In the meantime, thanks for listening, everybody, and as always, enjoy the comics.